Hi everyone and welcome. This is Seek Sustainable Japan. I'm JJ Walsh in Hiroshima and today I have the pleasure to talk with Andrew Russell, originally from Scotland, now based in Hyogo Prefecture, is that right? Prefecture, yeah. Yeah, and we had the uh, chance to talk a couple years ago, it's two years ago now, about uh, sake, of course. We're gonna be talking about sake again. Um, but this time we're talking also about your sake tours that you've started doing in the off season. So during your brewing season, which you just said was about six months of the year, uh, starting in October to March, uh, you're brewing sake. And then during the off season, you're doing tours. How's it been going so far? Yeah, it's it's been good. I, I really enjoy doing the tours. I, I love the region that that I do the tours in, the, the Nada Gogo. This is uh, Japan's un undisputed uh, brewing region in Japan. It's the biggest brewing region by volume. It's it's been that way for uh, for over two hundred years. So I love the region. It's the region where I work in the winter. So. Yeah, I, I'm very familiar there and I'm constantly bumping into people that I know as, as we do these tours. So it, it, although I don't live there when I'm not brewing, it kind of does feel a bit like home. So yeah, it's, uh, it's very good. I would like to be busier, uh, but the, the you know that, that's the nature, I guess, of uh, tourism. Right now is quite quiet because I guess people are uh, assuming that it's pouring with rain because it's rainy season, which actually hasn't really been the case. Um, but you know, before when when I finished brewing, when I first uh, got these tours up and running, it was uh, it was very busy because I, I think a lot of people came to enjoy the the lovely Japanese spring weather. So. Yeah, and now now we're in rainy season, uh, so it's kind of a low time uh, for tourism in Japan. But it's also a little bit cooler. Uh, so I've I've had more visitors coming, but I I think Andy, it just takes time to build up for people to know that you're doing it. And I think you'll get busier and busier. Um, my partner, Paul, said he went on your tour and he really learned so much about sake and he loved all the tastings and everything. Um, can you just give us an overview? Like what what do you offer on the tours? Sure, well, for, first and foremost, for anyone that hasn't heard of the location, uh, the, the, the region is called the Nada Gogo. The, the, the Nada Gogo is an association of five brewing regions, most of which were established, like I said, back in the in the Edo period. So the the, the Nada Gogo is it's actually quite spread out. It, there's it's about 24 kilometers from uh, from what's the east uh, the southeast part of Kobe uh, near Kobe City to Nishinomiya in the west. So to to do the the whole region is would be you know impossible to do any justice within a day so i concentrate like i said before on the region where i work which is kind of the middle bit uh, that's the the regions of uozaki and mikage and within those two brewing regions there is some very very famous sake breweries so you have the likes of kiku masamuni which were established in 1659 very famous for traditional brewing methods uh, we go to Hakatsuru, which is the the biggest brewery in Nada. It's actually a, a it was the same family as Kiku Masamuni. They branched off later in the Edo period, so it's a little bit newer, but it's still like what seventeen fifty, I think it was established. So extremely old um, by by uh, anyone's standards, really. And then the last place I go to, it actually, you see that picture up there is where that picture was taken. It's technically the company I work for. I work for uh, Kenbishi. That's that's my brewery. It's a former brewery of Kenbishi. They kind of left everything the way it was in the brewery and just put a bar down the middle of this uh, this building. So it's a very unique experience. You're literally drinking next to tanks and you're served things on you know, brewing equipment that's used for making koji and things. So, it, yeah, it's a fantastic location. Um, and, yeah, that, that's my tours. I do them on foot. Uh, there's obviously a, a, you know, obviously a big part of it is tasting sake. Every location we go to, we taste sake. But there's plenty of other tours, if I'm honest, that just do tasting. My, um, 
my goal really for for this tour, my objective was to um, to to really talk about the history of the region and to really so that people finish the tour and know why the region was became famous, what makes it special, and also what makes the the the, the sake that they're drinking that they've been enjoying throughout the day. How did it come to taste that way? So, um, so yeah, that that's the tour. It takes about four hours. It's quite it's quite a leisurely pace, but visiting you know three core sites within that is uh, is about right for for a four hour tour. And you know the last the last location as you can see in the picture there, it is a it's a you know a, a normal open bar. So there's other customers in there, and I like to just kind of you know relax a little bit when we get to that point. And you know that's that's really just where you do a, a tasting part, and we, we we don't talk about the history part. It's just to to enjoy the sake at that point. Uh, and in talking about enjoying the sake, I think that's something uh, we talked about last time a little bit. Uh, a lot of the visitors on my tours too, they're interested in sake, but they don't know much about it, and they. And then other people will say, I say, oh, have you tried sake? And they, they immediately they say, oh, I don't like it. I tried it once or something, you know, but something you were saying last time is just keep trying it. Just have an open mind. Uh, try it hot. Try it cold. Try it. Try it in the onsen. Try it in a wooden cup. Like just keep trying it in different ways. Um, sake is so different year by year as well, right? Yeah, it's, it's an incredibly versatile beverage. This is what I always try and get across to people. The way it's being drank at the moment, I think, is a bit of a shame. It's being pushed as this kind of wine equivalent. And to to, to drink it like a wine is you're really, you're just scratching the surface. It's not actually its natural element anyway, but it's testament to how versatile it is that you can drink it like a wine and you can enjoy it in with foods that you would typically enjoy with wine, like cheeses and things. It's actually a far better pairing with uh, with cheese than than wine. Uh, I know the, the wine people will probably shoot me for that. But uh, other than that, it's just so, like I said, versatile. That is the word I'm going to probably keep using tonight. It, it, it It's not fussy about what you pair it with. It's not fussy about where you drink it. It can be a very formal occasion or it can be a very informal occasion. The Japanese... You know, here they they drink it all the time outside, so it's 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 as comfortable in, you know, in a top end five star restaurant from a wine glass as it is from a simpler tumbler, a simple tumbler, you know, in a park somewhere, and of course it's, I guess it's um you know its main selling point is the fact that they they have sayings for this in Japan that it just pairs so well with almost anything i've yet to find a, a bad pairing which is why sake and food pairings are actually not really a thing in japan it's this is a modern thing that's coming from overseas consumers and that isn't to say that sake is not sophisticated or anything it's it's quite the opposite it's just such a versatile beverage to to pair with foods that you don't need to worry about it so uh, yeah i i always try and uh, shun that side of the in, the industry that that perhaps maybe wants to, to push it towards the higher end thing, which could be quite intimidating. And I think probably put some people off uh, and, and just say, just enjoy it, do it in your own way. Uh, try as much as you like and whatever, you know, after you've done all your experimentation, you're likely to find a style that suits you and an occasion that you, you like drinking it uh, at and, and just in, enjoy it from there. Absolutely. Um, on on my tour of Hiroshima City, uh, we walk through the grounds, the castle grounds, and there's a great little snack shop and they have really unusual flavors of ice cream. And one of them is sake ice cream. And I had a guest yesterday uh, from Boston and she tried it and she was like, this is so delicious. You know, and just having that open mind, just try it with different things. So I don't know if that in, that would be included with pairing, but sake ice cream is a bit out there at the moment, right? It's not something you see every day. <laughs> you, you can try it on my tour, actually. One of the breweries we go to, uh, Kiku Masamune, they, they do uh, a sake ice cream because the breweries is obviously a large size brewery. So they do everything from, you know, very niche uh, traditional products to to high end stuff, but they do things like cosmetics and things that are made from 
uh, things like sake kasu. You know, these are the the the, the, um, the byproduct of sake brewing. So yeah, it it actually the the, the connections with sake and other foodstuffs in Japan goes very deep. You know, sake is made from from koji, so koji is a superfood. It's extremely healthy. Doesn't sound particularly nice when you hear that it's a mold. But then, you know, cheese is made from mold as well. So, uh, but you, you look at the base of koji and then look at Japanese cuisine and there's, it, it, it's, you know, it's intertwined with, uh, with all kinds of different J uh, Japanese cuisine. So, so yeah, you know, sake, sake ice cream and uh, amazake, you know, these summer drinks that you get, the, these are all uh, connected to, uh, to the sake industry. Absolutely. Amazake, you just mentioned, is another one I try to get my guests to try. Now, it's a non-alcoholic fermented rice drink, which is, is made in the same way as, as sake, isn't that right? Uh, kind of, partially. Uh, well, well, there's actually, there, there's two types of Amazake. You need to be careful because some of them technically do have alcohol in them. So the if you, sake is made from koji, that's the the secret ingredient to uh, to sake brewing it's the engine behind the whole brewing process it's what provides enzymes and that that is what allow or makes it possible to uh, to ferment using a grain rather than uh, rather than a fruit which which has sugar in it so amazaki typically comes in two styles one is 100% koji so what they do is they they make the koji in the same way that they would for sake brewing and then they just mix that with hot water and it's a little bit more complicated than making it sound, but they, they basically um, let it, um, you know, come together. And that's that's Amazaki. Now, they used to drink that um, regardless of the season. It's got a reputation as a winter drink for some reason, but it's actually fantastic in the summer as well. And the Japanese sometimes drink it to fend off the summer heat because it's so good for you. It's loaded with yeah. amino acids and things. But oh, there is it's beautiful cold in summer, but also really nice warm with a bit of grated ginger in oh, winter. Yeah, that's, that's my favorite. Yeah. yeah I'm sorry. It's, hard, <laughs> it's it's hard to get in the mood for it because it's so hot today. But yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know that that in the that in the winter uh, sounds absolutely fantastic. But yeah there there is another type which is made from sake kasu. These are the sake lees. Uh, like I said, this is the byproduct of once you've pressed sake, you're left with solids and liquids. You drink the liquids, and then the solids are used for uh, a lot of other things like pickling and you know these kind of things. But you can add water to that sake kasu, and then you've got what's also called amazake. But sake kasu has a very low content of alcohol in it, which does go into the the amazake. So uh, it's not it's not going to be anything dangerously high, but technically speaking, it does have alcohol in it. <laughs> it's, it's, I think in America, like we have um, kombucha, right? We have a lot of fermented uh, drinks, which are very popular. Of course, Japan is all about the fermentation uh, for so many parts of the food and sake. Um, but I always say, I've heard so many Japanese women talk about amazake as the reason they have nice skin. Um, and of course, good gut bacteria, it's good for your health, um, but it's always fun to try. Um, also, another thing connected to beauty, which you mentioned, is using the byproduct of sake to make beautiful beauty soap. Um, this is something I often see in sake shops and I <clears throat> introduce to guests as well. Uh, do you also see that in a lot of sake shops in your area or on your tours? You, you do see that in NADA, yeah. Be, because, like I said, small breweries don't really have the means to to process these kind of things. It, it requires, you know, big investment to obviously to, to, to have the know-how to do it and then the machinery and the facilities and what have you. But when you get to the bigger breweries, uh, for example, Kiku Masamuni, they, they make a, a wide range of cosmetics and soaps and things like that. And obviously ice cream and Amazake and you can just buy Kasu as well. So when you're, when you're at their shop, they have all that stuff, no problem at all. Part of my other tour, I also do Nishinomiya, which is in the weekdays, but I haven't done as many tours as uh, Uozaki Mikage. I think just the fact that it isn't at the weekend and it's a little bit more higher level, it's things like, looking at the water, the famous water of Nada and stuff. 
But one of the breweries on that tour, a brewery called Nihon Sakari, uh, which is very, very famous brewery, they were the first to do cosmetics uh, from sake byproduct. So their shop is uh, is very well uh, represented with these kind of things as well. In fact, that would probably be the most famous uh, cosmetic product fr made from sake in Japan, I suspect. That's awesome. Um, that's something I've I've talked to people brewing beer, uh, talking about how they filter out uh, the waste product. They they have they give it to farmers. The the waste product is reused in farms. Um, it's it's of course a very important part of sustainability and the circularity of where your product comes from. Of course, the choosing the rice and the water is a very key key part. Um, but also in the now you wouldn't be doing tours at this time, you would still be doing brewing. But when I do tours in like January, February, quite often something we see in sake shops is is like it looks kind of like heavy tofu and it's a byproduct of sake making. And then people can buy it and put it in soups and stews. Have yeah. You, um, you know? is, is, is that I have to admit, I'm not. 100% familiar with it, but it sounds a bit like kasu. I think it is the kasu, yeah. yeah. Um, so, like, the, the ka kasu is the, uh, like, like I said before, kasu is the byproduct when uh, one of the legal requirements uh, from from way back uh, in the, to the Meiji period uh, for, for sake to obtain its legal definition, which is seishu, that means clear sake, is the uh, the, the literal translation of that, it has to be put through some form of press. And what the press does is it, it separates the, the liquids from the solids. And what, what you're left with is this sake kasu. Uh, so that, that is a, uh, that's a very modern machine or one of the more modern ones. It's kind of like an accordion press. But once it's finished, there's a huge amount of force getting forcing those panels together. And then once all the, the, the liquid is out and... Uh, taken off and put into a tank you open that up and you're left with this brilliant smelling uh, sake kasu it's it depending on how it's been made will depend on the thickness and its amino acid content and what have you but it's it's incredibly healthy it's i, I hear people saying just actually applying that to your to your face uh, i won't say who it is but there's someone in my family that always makes me um take it home and uh, she she puts it on her face, and that's maybe this uh, going back to what you're saying about some of the Japanese uh, women that you know claim to um, to to you know it's very good for their skin. So yeah, but but it can be used in other things like pickling. But you can also just put it in soup. They call that kasujiro, and that gets brought out at uh, during the winter. It, it's it's delicious. It's very healthy. Kasu has a very particular um aroma and it, it isn't to everyone's taste i have you, you tend to divide people into people that absolutely love it and the people that can't stand it but i'm on the the camp that uh, that likes it i guess i've just been around the stuff so uh, so long now that it's you know it's become something i recognize as, as delicious so so yeah that's probably what you're what you're meaning that is it's really what it looks like and if now that you mention it i i could take one of those layers it's like a pack of layers uh, that have been pressed like you said i could just cut out eyes and use it like a face mask that would make sense too <laughs> yeah, yeah you're absolutely good um depending depending on the castle that's quite an expensive face mask though i'll warn you yeah so it's it's um <laughs> It's not prohibitively expensive, but if you think of a bottle of sake at maybe 1,500 yen to 2,000 yen, a, a little bag about yay size of kasu is going to set you back about five, 600 yen. So, you know, for from a, from a top producer. So it's not super cheap, but it's not super expensive either. Yeah. Now, one of the things we talked about the first time, of course, connected to reusing and sustainability uh, is how you can uh, still reuse the bottles, the big bottles. 
And um, I, when I go to beer places that are making their own beer, I will take my own, what is it called? I, I forgot the name, but some my own container that you can ask them to refill. And I have a vision of taking one of those giant sake bottles to a brewery. Can you do that? Can you take your own bottle back? Or they just give you a, another one, but they take it back, right? They, they, they do, yeah. They t not, not all of them. But the, put it this way, the first brewery I worked at, it was a daily thing that the, the local people would come and there was a spot where they all knew, you know, you don't need to bother any of the staff, you don't need to announce yourself or what have you. You can just walk in and put this bottle down there and they, they would take them away. Unfortunately, we can't use all of them. There was a couple that we couldn't use. These were typically um, things like shoyu and things that no matter how many times you clean them, you just can't get that that smell away, which is uh, which is not what you want when you open up a bottle. But if, you, if you've had nihonshu or shochu in them, then the vast majority of the time, then what we're doing is we're putting them aside, we're washing them, and then they're they're getting uh, recycled uh, into the system, and that'll happen, you know, until it breaks. So the that is the you know the good thing about glass bottles. I was hoping you weren't going to bring this up tonight though, because there's a bit of a crisis at the moment in the industry after uh, COVID. One of the the major bottle makers, and I believe maybe another smaller one, went out of business during. Uh, COVID, um, probably because sake was not circulating, and not just sake, but shochu and you know everything else that goes into these these bigger bottles, they they just they just weren't circulating at any any kind of pace like they used to do. So businesses like like a lot of other businesses suffered, and some went out of business. And it happened that one of the major ones went out of business. So there is actually a quite serious shortage of the bottles right now. So. To put a positive spin on that, if you have these bottles and you live next to Saki Brewery, they are more than likely, I think I can say with confidence, speak for them, they are more than likely going to be delighted to see these things because the price is going up for them and there there is a, a nationwide shortage of them and they're looking at alternatives which are uh, less sustainable, things like pouches and these kind of things that are that are not as good and of course even cartons which are paper but they're not really paper they're they're you're lined with plastic and they're wrapped and you know these kind of things the bottle is surely as much as i'm not an expert on these things the bottle is surely the, the most sustainable version of that so you definitely want to uh, that that to continue rather than you know alternative packaging Absolutely. And um, that was one of the interesting things that you're adding on the tour is about the wooden barrel making. And that's something that I've talked with other people on the on the talk show about uh, bringing back the demand for making the wooden barrels because the flavor is enhanced. Um, I heard you had this great uh, story about how sake was shipped to Edo and it had this great flavor of the wood. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, of course. So du during the Edo period, of course, there's no glass bottles. There was no glass bottles until uh, about the late Meiji period. That's when that's when everything changed and bottles uh, became the, the main uh, vessel for transportation and uh, for, for, for selling. But before that, th there was a number of things they did to get around that. But for the transportation side of it, they were they were they were they were directly bottled into these things called taru, and they're beautifully or ornately designed as well. You still see them outside a lot of other breweries, but it was a much more practical use back then. That was the only way they they had. Now the the Nada region it became famous. A big part of its uh, its success came from its location next to the sea during the Edo period. That was the primary. Uh, method of transport for trans uh, for transporting sake and um, what they would do is they would load the these big barrels onto boats and the, the voyage would take about 10 to 14 days and when this started obviously it, it the distribution would not have went that far so it was a big thing for establishing the region to you know to be this big region that was supplying edo which became a uh, 
Tokyo. But on the voyage, it was getting the sake was getting rocked about in within this uh, sugi. It's a it's a they, they say it's a, a Japanese cedar. It's actually not a cedar, but it, it's quite fragrant. It's got a lovely smell if you ever get to to hold cedar. And by the time it reached Edo, it had imparted a, a very um, particular aroma and taste to the sake. And if anyone wants to try exactly what that is, then you can go into most companies in Japan and pick up a Taruzake one cup from Kikumasamuni, which is the brewery I go to. Kikumasamuni still incredibly make sake in this way. Obviously, the sake doesn't have the voyage of going to, to Edo anymore, but what they do is they bottle it and they age it for about two weeks, which is about roughly the same time it would have taken to get to Edo, and you get this lovely uh, sugi aroma into the into the sake. And yeah, part of the tour, about 35, 40 minutes, is spent in the workshop where they make these things. And that, that came about through sheer necessity, the the, the craftspeople that were, were making these exquisitely handcrafted taru and obviously making wooden tanks and everything, that became a dying craft when bottles and enamel tanks and stainless steel tanks and what have you became the norm. But Kiku Masamuni wanted to keep that that style of sake, that characteristic. So the only way they could do that was to do it all themselves. So they they formed a, a separate business within their primary business of making sake and they started training up uh, these craftspeople. And I think there's about five of them now that make uh, make about 15 a day, I think it is. So the next time you go to the combini and you see sake and you think, well, that's just some cheap one cup. If, if you do the tour, you'll really see how, how difficult it is to do that. But that's actually probably about as craft as you're ever going to find uh, in, in the entire sake industry. So um, That's really interesting. So even, even some of the practices of the bigger breweries uh, is really a craft, you know, like a artisan lo using local traditional ways, uh, even maybe more in some ways than some of the smaller breweries, right? That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it's not a very popular opinion. It, 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 I tend to get a bit of a reaction when I say to this to people in, in the industry, but, but actually the, the opinion of Nada brewers and Fushimi brewers and to a certain extent Saijo brewers is these big factory-like breweries that are churning out cheap table sake with no regard to the process and what have you. And for sure that kind of thing does exist. That kind of sake does get made typically by the bigger breweries. But these breweries often, I mean often, nearly always, make extremely quality handcrafted sake as well. And in all honesty, the ones that do are far more of the image of craft that people have in their mind than the breweries that are seen as the paragon of uh, the paradigm of, of, of craft. The you know, for example, Kiku Masamuni they were the last bastion of Kimoto up until it became trendy and the smaller breweries started to, to pick up on this. And honestly, it's these are the people that taught these smaller breweries how to do these traditional crafts. Kimoto, which is kind of a trendy thing at the moment, it's a, it's a traditional method of making the yeast starter that goes to the, to the Edo period. It's extremely laborious, extremely um, time-consuming very difficult to do it requires a high level of skill it, it was really only nada brewers and one up in tohoku that were doing that for for decades and then it became trendy and smaller breweries did it and of course things like you know taruzaki you know going going to the lengths of you know making you know wooden uh, containers you know these taru and tanks and wooden instruments and what have you virtually all of these breweries that still do that in any capacity are in the nada region for example ken bc the brewery i work in kiku masamuni um so so yeah there's there's a bit of a um i don't know how to put it but the the the, the image of these nada brewers is is wrong uh, and the image of smaller breweries is often wrong as well and that that isn't to criticize 
the smaller breweries. It's just to point out the fact that these breweries are have the means and the the skill. Very importantly, the the, the staff that are trained to do these kind of things that they can still continue to nurture these uh, traditional techniques. And without them, most of them wouldn't be in practice anymore. They would have they would have been lost uh, to history. I think these are the kind of stories which make it really interesting and why you want a guide when you're walking around because it's not only about how much was this sake polished or is it a dry or a sweet taste you know it's it's more like the kind of pol not not really the politics but like the the history of the brewers but how it connects to the past but also connects to the present situation as well uh, one of the interesting uh, stories I tell is about when uh, President Obama came to Hiroshima and it was a big deal choosing what sake he was going to be given at the dinner. Now he was with Prime Minister Abe and I heard Abe wanted the famous one from Yamaguchi, but because it was in Hiroshima, one of our most famous Hiroshima sakes was chosen and it's the one with the gold leaf in. And whenever I go in Hiroshima sake uh, liquor shops, they always have a picture of Abe and Obama together drinking this one. Um, so it's it's one of the most interesting stories, I think, for the visitors, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I know what you're talking about in that. They 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 tried Kamotsuru, didn't they? It was the Kamotsuru um, gold flake daiginjo. But of course, Abe would have uh, would have been very keen to for it to be Dasai, and I think they they really pushed Dasai on the political front very heavily. I think there was a lot of other events where they managed to to get Dasai served to uh, to customers, uh, to you know, to these diplomats and what have you. So it, it almost became soft power, you know, Yamaguchi sake. But but the good thing about that is Yamaguchi was not doing particularly well up until quite recently and that's a, a region that has really become rejuvenated through these kind of things so not just Dasai the fact that there's there's incredible brewers down there so you, sometimes these smaller regions uh, it's good to get them in the in the spotlight so I, I don't you know I don't feel bad that if Dasai being on that stage had a trickle down effect for you know these other small breweries then uh, then I guess that's a, a good thing yeah, absolutely. Now, before we started, you were actually telling me um, some kind of shocking statistics of how few sake brewers we have now compared to uh, the Meiji period, for example. Can you give us a little overview of that? Uh, well, th 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 I'll try and make it as quickly as possible, but it's, it's, it's obviously not quite as simple as this. But in the Edo period, uh, so what's that, the, the 17th century until the, the late uh, 19th century or mid 19th century sake brewing was all controlled by the the tokugawa shogunates they issued licenses and or permits to brew they controlled how much you were allowed to brew they controlled who it was being sold to sometimes they even controlled what they were making they were all allocated an amount of rice and what have you it was extremely heavily controlled and then when the tokugawa shogunate collapsed the the meiji rulers were obviously you know the the sad part of this history is they were they had uh, ambitions to to become an empire and there was a lot of wars there was the wars with china there was the wars with uh, russia and the sake industry unfortunately you know funded a lot of that so it really if, the, if you thought the tokugawa shogun it had a firm grip on it the meiji rulers had a, an, an you know an iron grip on it and they controlled huge amounts of the uh, of the industry and very very tightly as well and what they did to raise taxes they realized that it was it was brilliant at generating taxes is they just opened up the licensing system so they basically said anyone can have a license uh, as long as you pay a fee and as long as you keep brewing sake so it went into the tens of thousands very very quickly but it's often attributed to the war that there was this massive decline. It actually declined a lot quicker than that because sake brewing is extremely complicated and you need skilled people to do it. And a lot of the brewers didn't realize that. It's one of these things that looks quite simple from the outside looking in. 
But the reality for a lot of them was they didn't know how to make sake and businesses folded rapidly. But then the, the, the second punch, I guess, was the war period. It, it becomes very, very tightly controlled again. Rice becomes something that they're not willing to, uh, to waste on sake because there's a rice shortage. And of course, after the war, the rice shortages continued. So again, there was a limit on what breweries could, could do and what they could uh, make. And you have this really bad period of shortages of sake after the war which led to very cheap, nasty stuff getting brewed. There's there's one called like triple yielded sake that was based on synthetic um, sake techniques that they conjured up in the war and things. So it was a really bad time for the industry. And unsurprisingly, consumers start to turn to Western beverages. You know, you had things like Suntory Tories and, you know, Tories Bar became this huge thing in the 50s and the 60s. And people were all of a sudden drinking whiskey and then that leads to drinking wine. And Shotu had a real go at saying they were healthy. And so there was a big drop again. And I think by the 1960s, they were down to about 4,000 odd breweries. And then, of course, you've got another few things that add to that, the oil shop crisis and uh, obviously the fact that consumers are not drinking as much as they used to and the, all these things ha had an effect people obviously younger people don't want to do the the grueling work of brewing and breweries simply close because they didn't have enough staff and like you said where we are now there's it's hard to put a figure on it exactly where they are because having a license doesn't mean you're actually brewing but there's probably about 1150 active brewers in Japan, it, it fluctuates every year, and they're not issuing licenses for to make seishu. So that number isn't expected to to rebound anytime quickly. The only hope they have is people that have held on to licenses, done enough to keep them, will you know see fit to uh, to resurrect their business and to give it another shot. And that's really the only way that the numbers can uh, can go up. But obviously, it's driven on demand and consumption. Oh, that's a, a really impressive roundup of a short, shortened version of the history. Thank you so much for that. Um, but it really shows how, um, and this is something I hear all the time, that the export market for sake is so important. And so, of course, in that way, also introducing the sake culture and sake itself to international visitors is a part of building the export brand, I would think, right? Do you, do you see that as you're doing tours? Yeah, absolutely. Sake tourism is, is probably the first step to get people interested in sake. I mean, anyone that lives here just needs to open their eyes. There's tourists everywhere. You know, I, I've only been in Japan for about 10 years or something. I think I first came here about 20 years ago as a visitor. And every year you see more tourists. So tourism is absolutely booming here. And a lot of people know of sake. It's one of the things when you think of Japan, you probably think Shinkansen, cherry blossoms, sumo, sushi, Mount Fuji, and you're probably thinking sake as well. So it's on people's to-do lists. So you, even if they don't have the intention of it becoming part of their everyday consumption, so there, there is a chance to to convert these people into sake drinkers. So my I do see my job as I've got about four hours to to make them see what, what I see in sake, which is this incredible beverage, and what other people working in the industry see is this, this incredibly versatile, uh, enjoyable drink that, you know, is uh, is just, just a great companion to the meal or, or drinking on its own. And hopefully from that they'll say well, okay well maybe we'll investigate it when we get back to our country or you know that's that's their kind of hook uh, into getting it because by the time it gets overseas this is not a fault of the 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 people that are importing it to, to their own countries it's very very expensive it's prohibitively expensive in some countries you're talking you know four times the price that it would be in japan retail you, you get it into a restaurant and you know 
the, the sky's the limit. You, you, you don't know kind of what markup you're paying up, but the prices are completely different overseas to what they are in Japan. So if you've not had that experience in Japan, you, you might, uh, you very, very well may just pass on it and think, well, it's too expensive. It's a risk. You know, isn't that just the stuff that, you, you know, the, the, the cheap stuff that they drink hot and what have you. So, so yeah, sake tourism uh, is, is a big part of, you know, in, increasing consumption uh, overseas as well and increasing awareness overseas. Absolutely. Um, I love that uh, uh, example of, of how to hook people. I think I think those stories that you tell and you have a, a master's in Japanese studies as well. Uh, how much of, the, of that learning comes into the stories you tell or is it mostly from your experience with the brewers uh, and brewing yourself? Uh, it's kind of a combination, I imagine, of both. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of both. Like, I, I, I love Japanese history. That's why that's why I, my degree was, uh, like you said, my master's was uh, was in Japanese. It wasn't just the language. It was about half history, culture, and half uh, actual Japanese uh, language. So, of course, when you're talking about these periods, you know, the, the Sengoku period or the Muromachi period, and, you know, these all have distinct uh, points in, in Saki's history, and you can kind of relate the, the sake industry to what was happening at the time and of course the Edo period as well which is kind of my my biggest point of interest and then obviously into the you know the Meiji period and stuff so you kind of need a little bit of a background a bit a bit of context to what was going on you know what was the the political landscape at the time you know there was a lot of wars for example during the Muromachi period and the Sengoku period and obviously that that goes without saying and that had an effect on the sake industry and then the Edo period is this very peaceful time Japan is is virtually closed although it's not a closed country like what people are saying and so the, the sake industry really thrives in that point and that's where really the foundations of the sake industry were, were formed so so yeah when when i am doing my tours uh, as much as people will listen without getting too bored uh you know because some people do just want me to show up and drink which is which is absolutely fine as well and um, but i do try and get in as much of the the, the history aspect as uh, as my guests will allow me to <laughs> Now you're you're originally from Scotland. Um, something I've noticed uh, with Hiroshima sake brewers is they're diversifying. So they have sake, but also they're adding making whiskey, making gin um, to help their business be more resilient, I imagine. But to the visitor, it makes it more appealing that they can try other products that maybe they're more familiar with. Are you seeing this as a trend around Japan, or is that kind of Hiroshima specific? Maybe uh, no, it's it's a trend in Japan, definitely. I, mean, I have to admit, I'm a little ambivalent about the whole thing because, in one sense, yes, it's good, and it might bring it might bring people in that you know want to try a gin or a whiskey, and then they end up drinking sake. But at the same time, there is the part that you think, well, they're they're obviously doing it for a, a reason, and the reason may well be that the the sake side of things isn't sustaining itself so they're they're doing it to to stay afloat now there there, there has been a trend uh, it seemed to be mostly beer for a while but sake brewers were making beer and again i mean no disrespect to the other industries and what have you but if you can make sake then there's a good chance you can make pretty decent beer it's the other way around would be very difficult because there's so much extra process that goes into making sake than there is beer. The same would go for wine. And again, the wine people will probably shoot me for that, but that, that is my opinion. Sake is a process driven beverage. So when you're at that level of being able to brew sake, there, there obviously there's a lot of byproducts as well that you can make things like shochu from but just being able to to have the techniques to do that it's probably not as much of a a jump as it would be for a complete beginner to get into something like this distillation or making beer or wine or something like that and i think that's actually one of the reasons for the crossover but there's some very interesting businesses that are forming from this a good friend of mine works in kyoto 
at a very small brewery. In fact, it's the only city centre sake brewery left in Kyoto. Kyoto used to have about 300 brewers and they were all in the centre of Kyoto. Now all the production has moved to Fushimi, but there is one left, uh, Matsui Shuzo. And it's, it's a very uh, unorthodox brewery. It's very small. You could almost call it a craft um, operation. It's done in the, the, the lower level of an apartment building. So it's actually very easy to miss it. But they've just started um, diversifying their product lineup and it's working very well for them. So they make gin. They have plans to make whiskey and what have you in the future. They're doing doing all kinds of liqueurs and you know these kind of things. So there's some there's some good success stories coming out of it. But there is still the part of me that that uh, would still rather that sake was enough to you know to be profitable for 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 everyone. Yeah, absolutely. I I do see the argument. Um, if you're like uh, on your tours, you take people to bars. Uh, where they can try different sakes, but sometimes you might have a group and in the group there's people who either don't drink at all or they're really anti-sake. Uh, they might be into trying a beer or trying a whiskey or a gin instead. Um, so in that way, you might kind of hook them by getting into the sake culture, by being around it. Um, anyway, that's that's one possible argument for it as well, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Some of the places you're taking people to, uh, not only having the sake, but also having little snacks as well, uh, looks really lovely. Yeah. So the, the final place that we go to, like like I said, it's a really unique experience. The It's called the, the Nada Gogo Sake Tokoro. It, it, like I said, it does belong to Ken Bishi. It's in a former brewery of Ken Bishi. But the 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 concept of it is nada sake. It's not kenbishi. You'll see the staff. They'll all be wearing different breweries. In fact, there's representation from all 26 breweries within the nada gogo, and the walls are lined with with all these. I mean, that's that's kenbishi's uh, happy. But there's also two other breweries there. Um, but literally, there's every brand is represented, and you can try all different kinds of nada sake so yeah that 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 bar is um it is a bit of a unique experience but the concept behind that bar originally was food pairings to show how versatile particularly nada sake is that's something that i should emphasize a lot of modern sake is very high in aromatics uh, that set, tends to be what's trending they're they're, they're trying to make a, a sake that's similar to wine or that appeals to wine customers now they make that in nada they can make that with their eyes closed in nada they have the, the the technology and the means and the skill to to make anything they want that's how well funded some of these breweries are but the actual traditional style in nada the the typical style in nada is what they would call ajike not kaurike so it's more flavor driven rather than uh, aroma driven and if you've got flavor driven sake then it pairs with food so at the, the Narasaki Tokoro, yes, I do uh, an otsumami, which are more than just, you know, a couple of pickles thrown on a plate. Hopefully, um, you know, your 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 husband can <laughs> attest to that. Uh, so, so yeah, it, you know, it, it would be remiss to do a sake tour and not serve it at some point with food, because like I said, that is one of its uh, specialties. Absolutely. Uh, one thing I was really impressed uh, when I did a sake tasting with one of your your old colleagues, uh, Miho Imada, oh, yeah. Uh, she, yeah. she she would often have the pairing the pairing with delicious food, but also with each sake she introduced, she often would give us the water that it was made with, and I I love that experience of drinking the water the pure water with the sake and it just enhances it plus you're hydrating which is good when you're out drinking right um is this like a common practice when you do the the tastings do they often have the water as much as it's feasible a lot of people like to do it they do that at the nada sake tokoro for example they uh, the famous water is a uh, miyamizu in nada they serve uh, the brewing water, it's not typically Miyamizu, but it's uh, its water from the Rocco mountain range. It's typically, it has characteristics. It's hard, which is unusual for Japan, or it's, it's hard water for Japan. So, yeah, the brewers, 
the brewers know how important the water source is. So they tend to be A, very proud of it, but B, want to actually let people try it to see what they're brewing with, to see what is actually having such an influence on it. So you do see that as often as it's feasible to do that. Now, of course, me, you're talking about uh, Miho Imada, where she is, it's the opposite of Nada. They they have extremely soft water and they have a very fascinating history based around how they worked out how to brew with that. This was a more modern uh, thing than uh, than the, the Nada region, the Nada story. So she's obviously very, very proud of that, that characteristic. It's one of the first things you're going to mention when you talk about Fukucho is made with very soft water from Akitsu. There, you know, there's. I, I don't have time to go through it all tonight, but there's a whole interesting story about that. If you just Google Miura Senzaburo, that is the the gentleman who uh, who discovered this method of brewing with soft water, and uh, he's the one that came up with the name for Miho's sake brand. So, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I'm totally with you on that as well. It's great to try that's water. Something that's been used to yeah and and if you go around uh the saijo sake area where all the brewers are right next to the station it's a great place to explore sake in hiroshima uh they kamosuru and a lot of the brewers have the spring water available for you to fill up your water bottles as you walk around the town but also to drink in combination with their tasting which i think is awesome yeah, and it's a busy well. I know the one you're talking about, the, the one just at the entrance to Kamotsuru. There's always someone there filling up their bottle. And then I think if you go around the corner to, I think it's maybe Saijotsuru, they also allow people to fill up. Uh, I think that's fantastic. You know, it, it, it's, it's also a bit of an advert for the brewery because if people are saying, there's obviously people, they're so close together in Saijo. You know, all the breweries are not far apart. So if if you're living there, you can probably choose which well that you want to go and fill up. And I'm sure people have got their favourites, you know, ones they like more than other ones. And that surely has to lead into a bit of favouritism towards the sake as well. So I actually think it's a, a, a little bit of a clever marketing to, to get people... You know, the next stage is, well, I'm drinking the water. I'll, I'll just buy their sake now as well. So. Absolutely. Plus, we just don't have enough water refilling stations around. Um, so it's something that I always recommend. And I saw that they were all listed on My Mizu, the app where you can find where to refill for free, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Now, one, one other thing we haven't talked about yet, which I think uh, visitors are always really interested in, are the aprons that people wear in sake shops, which we're seeing right behind uh, as we talk today. Can you give us a little introduction? There's so many yeah. beautiful ones. Sorry, I was I was just looking over my shoulder because I, I have a beautiful one. A, a, every brewery I've worked in, it's been my souvenir that I've I've taken away. These are these are called my kake. They're they're actually used by the brewers quite often. They're they're good to 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 wear as, a, as an apron if you're working in a rice polishing mill, for example, when you're doing bottling, you, you're constantly scuffing your clothes and stuff. So they are worn by the breweries, but they're, they're obviously, they are a bit of an advertisement as well. They're handed out at events sometimes. Uh, they're worn by people at events. It's a very visual thing to, to, to have on when you wear them. But I, I have my own little collection. So I, I have the, the one from my first brewery and from, uh, obviously, the beautiful one from Fukucho uh, with Imada that's actually been updated now, and uh, obviously I have my uh, my Kenbishi one. But yeah, th these are these are of course a, a traditional garment that would uh, that would been worn by people in uh, in the industry that has uh, that's thankfully been uh, continued in into this day. Most brewery shops that you go into in Japan will sell them. Uh, that that picture you're seeing in the background is actually a kakuuchi, so I don't know how you tra uh, translate that. So it's like a standing sake bar. I'm still not sure 100 what the difference is between tachinomi and kakuuchi. They, they, it's, it's like a sake shop that you can just pick up the products and start drinking and eating. They're a uh, little hidden gem uh, in Japan, but they they have the, this beautiful display. These are all from Hyogo. So you're seeing uh, 
there's one there I can see Ban Shuikon, which is uh, up in uh, Harima, and then Oku Harima, obviously from the same region, and then some that are further up, and then there's some from the the Naga region as well. That's Hakutaka that that you see in the background. So oh, already we're talking about the product. So yeah, it's again fantastic advertising from the from the brewers. Absolutely. Now, since you started doing tours, you had a very famous guest. I did indeed. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Gauntner, probably the most well-known sake professional uh, in Japan. He he's a lovely man. I've known him for I've known him almost my entire career. I actually got in touch with him before I even started brewing. He he's just one of these very helpful people that has dedicated his life to to supporting the industry and he's been very influential and I think he's done very, very well at attracting overseas uh, consumers, probably more so than anyone else, to be fair. So we're, we're all kind of thankful for the for the, the foundations that, that he's laid, but he is also a, an incredible Saki geek and he, he got in touch and uh, just towards the end of the brewing season, I was one of the first people that that, uh, that that came to visit me in Nada. So that is outside Kiku Masamuni, and we'd just done a tour of my my brewery in Kenbishi and what have you. So um, yeah, it was a it was a real privilege to uh, to have such a famous face um, come come to Nada to visit. That's awesome. Um, so you will be offering tours uh, on most days. Give us a little rundown of how people can book a tour with you and get more information. Sure. So the, the tours that we've been talking about for most of this episode, uh, Uozaki and Mikage, it's on my website as Nada West Tour. It is actually the central part, but the other parts in the east. So it just makes sense to call them East, east and West. That tour runs on a Friday, Saturday, and a Sunday. Unfortunately, that is the only days that I can do that because the, the one of the locations the, that we've been talking about, the Nada Gogo Saki Tokoro, that there, it's only open on Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays. So, unfortunately, I'm limited to that. If it was open during the week, then I would, I would certainly extend that tour. On the days that I don't do that, then I go to Nishinomiya. As I said, the content, if I'm being honest, is a little higher level because we're talking about things like the very famous water that they have in Nada, the, the Miyamizu, so we go and see the wells and what have you. But there is still brewery visits, and the I guess the very interesting uh, finale, other than they're out as an alternative to the Nadasaki Tokoro, is we go to a traditional kakuchi, which is where you're seeing these maikake. I think, I'm probably not wrong in saying that a lot of people come to Japan and never notice these places. They don't look particularly appealing from the outside. They're usually small, family-owned, and not really designed to catch your eye and, and welcome you in. They just look like a you know, a pretty old liquor store from the outside. But on the inside, you tend to find some incredibly warm people that, like I said, they're, they're almost always family owned. It'll be, you know, a father and wife combination. This is a father, uh, this is a, a mother and son combination. There's a lovely couple that, that run the place. And so I finished the tour there. So we're, we're still doing all the visiting famous breweries, but we're doing a little bit more sightseeing and we go to the Kakuchi. The only day that doesn't run is a Tuesday. Uh, that tends that seems to be the day off for everyone or in Nishinomiya. So and that's the day I've picked as a day off. But outside of that, it's it's uh, it's available every day. That's awesome. And it seems like you have a combination of not only sake tasting, but you're also visiting museums, which sometimes are very difficult uh, to understand for people who don't read and speak Japanese. So having a local guide. Uh, really helps. Um, also going to the workshop to see how the wooden barrels are made and then meeting the local uh, people who are in the sake shops and uh, maybe even some brewers along the way if they pop in or uh, yeah, absolutely. sometimes you might. Yeah. So one of one of the places I go to, Kiku Masamuni, the, 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 the master brewer works in the shop during summer because 
obviously they're not they're not brewing and uh, he's he's a good friend of mine he's a very famous toji he's part of a, a very exclusive guild called the tamba guild they're they're up in the, the northern uh, the middle region of hyogo sasayama and he's usually around and if he is around he'll he'll come over and say hi and make some jokes and sometimes sneak in a bit of free sake if i'm if i'm honest as well and um, but the museum part as well that is that is a big part for me i'm never going to change that the these museums like you can see there they typically have very old edo period brewing equipment which is really the foundations of the sake industry but as luck would have it, the, the brewery I work for is extremely traditional and they are one of the few breweries left in Japan that still use a lot of these, these old uh, fantastic wooden tools and instruments. That is their method of brewing. That's how Kenbishi brew sake. So I think... It's it's the one time I'll be immodest. I think possibly I'm the only tour in Japan that has hands-on a tour guide in Japan that has hands-on experience using these equipment. So it, it, to, to me, it would just be uh, silly not to to talk about them because before I started using them, they, it is very complicated and it is very difficult to find information on them online. And if you do, they're in Japanese and they tend to be using vocabulary that most Japanese would have to start looking up as well. So, yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting part of the tour uh, to, to to see how sake brewing was done in the past, but also is continuing into the present day in very, very uh, few few locations. Yeah, that's an amazing point. Um, I haven't come across any guides who have actually been brewers either. Um, so this is a great point to sign up for a tour uh, with Andy if you're in the or passing through the Hyogo area, which is very central uh, as you're traveling around Japan. So it's very easy to get to. Uh, not too far from Kobe and Osaka, is that right? Yeah, it's it's really easy to get to. I, I can't stress that enough. I've had a few people saying, you know, why don't you do tours in Fushimi? Because that's where everyone is, because obviously everyone goes to Kyoto and not everyone's going to come to Kobe. Kobe is quite a popular location, but not everyone's going to come there. People come to, to eat Kobe beef. You know, outside of that, it's shopping and bars and what have you. There's not a huge amount of sightseeing in Kobe, but it's so easy to get to. If you're in Kansai, then you can get to where I am very easy. Nishinomiya is about 20 minutes on the train from Osaka. There's, it, It's well connected. Sanomiya is obviously a central hub. It's a transportation hub. There's about five or six main lines go, go right the way through there. There's Shinkansen as well. But if you're in the Kansai region, for example, you're coming from Kyoto or you're coming from even better Osaka, it's really, really close. 20, 25 minutes uh, maximum. If you're coming from the other side, maybe from Himeji, then it takes a little bit longer, but there's plenty of express trains or the Shinkansen as well. So really the, the whole it's not Kyoto thing was never a, a, an issue for me. It, it shows you a part of Japan that you're, uh, although it's in a big city, it is actually off the beaten track. There's probably not much reason to go there other than for the sake breweries. So it's a it's a chance to see a side of Japan that uh, that you wouldn't normally see as well. Absolutely, and so many people are now uh, finding Kyoto not the best place to travel. Uh, because of over tourism, it's a lot of visitors who are coming to Hiroshima are saying, I wish I didn't plan to stay so long in Kyoto. It's so busy every day. Um, so getting off the beaten track, coming to places like where you are, uh, people will really appreciate it. And uh, especially if it's well connected um, by public transport. Well, that's all the time we have. But thank you so much, Andy, for joining and sharing all your insights. Good luck with your tours. I hope I can come and do it soon myself one day. I would love that. And uh, thank you very much for having me on. It was a pleasure uh, as, as it was before. So I can't believe it's been two years already. But, uh, but yeah, thank you very much for having me on and listening. Of course. And uh, good luck with your podcast as well. We didn't mention that. Uh, where? What's the name of your podcast if people want to listen to that? 
Yeah, so I, I do a podcast with a good friend of mine called Jim Ryan. He is a, a, a Saki writer and translator. Uh, he's the, the author of a book on Yamaguchi Saki, which is a fantastic book. Uh, I recommend going to buy to buy that if you ever get a chance. But yeah, we do a, we do a podcast called Saki Deep Dive. It is, uh, we make no bones about it. It is aimed at the beyond beginner. So it is not talking about uh, entry level you know, Saki 101 it is the, the, the next level from that. We are about to release another episode uh, on the 1st of July, which is going to be on uh, Okayama. So that's uh, another region very close to my heart. So hopefully if anyone's interested, then they can check us out on Spotify or uh, iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andy. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Great to see you uh, as we are live. Louise Louise is a tour guide herself coming from New Zealand and does some guiding in Japan as well. Oh, well, thank you for listening, Louise, and keep up the good work. And you too. And uh, take care, everyone.